my talk now is about one specific event of gravitational waves arising from two black holes that were colliding about 1.3 billion years ago. Um, black holes are regions of space and time with ever increasing curvature, their vacuum, so I'm not putting any spheres in this movie here. Uh, and you see the, the presence of the black hole in the curvature of this plane that is rotating around as the two black holes are rotating around. This is a computer calculation performed here in Canada, one of the ones that Lewis was referring to, that tells us what happens when black holes collide, and that also tells us the, the characteristic gravitational wave shape they are emitting when they are colliding. Now the movie is slowing down because the black holes have approached each other and about to collide, which is where the warpage of space and time is most extreme. Afterwards, you have one larger black hole formed, uh, space is settling down again into a quiescent state, and the gravitational waves are propagating out into the universe, into all directions away from the, uh, from the merger of these two black holes. 1.3 billion years later, this particular gravitational wave has hit Earth about two years ago. And as Lewis pointed out, when a gravitational wave propagates through Earth, it stretches and squeezes Earth and any type of matter in space and time itself in a very characteristic pattern. To get a sense of how minute these distortions actually are, this movie was exaggerated, how minute these, uh, these distortions actually are, I need to resort to remind you of a few small, small things. Starting with a human hair, which has a diameter of about 0.1 millimeters, or is about a million atoms across. And an atom itself has a very tiny nucleus in the, in the middle that is only about 100,000th time the size of an atom. So when gravitational waves hit Earth, the, the strongest ones there are, they deform the Earth by roughly the size of a nucleus. The instruments with which we are trying to detect gravitational waves are smaller than the Earth, so the, the deformations within the instruments are smaller still. We are talking at, at a, a change in length of about one in a thousandth times the size of an atomic nucleus, or one in a hundred millionth of the size of an atom. It's utterly astoundingly small effects we need to measure in order to detect those amazingly large and violent explosions. Okay, people actually have, have done this. The LIGO instruments two years ago have detected the very first gravitational wave and two more since then. Uh, LIGO consists of two identical um, observatories, one in Washington State called, uh, in a place called Hanford, and one in Livingston, Louisiana. Each one of these observatories has a big central station with laser uh, systems in it, and it then bounces laser beams along these four kilometer long arms in two different directions. Um, what happens is indicated here, so the laser light is bouncing around the two arms, and the whole system is set up in such a way that when a gravitational wave comes by, you get a tiny amount of light out here at the output port. The physical principle behind uh, has to do with the wave nature of light, that you have the waves of, of the light going along the arms, and the arms are arranged precisely such that at the output port, you, there is destructive interference and no light is coming out here, except when a gravitational wave actually wiggles the mirrors, and, and this offsets this, this delicate balance of, of uh, arrangement here, and then there's a little bit of light coming out of the dark port. That's the fundamental idea in, in how uh, LIGO is detecting gravitational waves. There's a vast amount of extra difficulties and challenges and, and, and fine print in this experiment. Um, and here I'm showing a few images of, of the LIGO instrument in, in Livingston. This is the central station with the beam splitter, uh, these vacuum vessels are about four or five meters high, and here is the, the one arm and the other arm going off for four kilometers into uh, four kilometers distance. LIGO actually are the biggest vacuum systems in the world, the biggest hole in the Earth's atmosphere. Um, here's one of the, the stations with the delicate mirror assembly uh, 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 built to isolate from any external perturbations. And at the bottom of this assembly hang the actual LIGO mirrors. They're about 40 centimeters across, uh, among the most perfectly polished surfaces that we've ever done. 
this in instrument is very complicated and so the collaboration that has developed it, is building it and operating it, has about a thousand people involved, scattered about 60 or 70 institutions uh, on, on essentially all continents. Canada is represented here in Toronto through the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics. Okay, so what have we seen? Um, almost two years ago, the first gravitational wave was measured and it was announced with big fanfare about one and a half years ago in February last year. Um, the Hanford instrument measured this particular shape of the gravitational wave, uh, increasing amplitude, increasing frequency, until eventually uh, everything settles down to zero again. And here's this remarkably small scale of 10 to the minus 21 that, that Lewis was already alluding to. Livingston has seen a very similar looking shape shown in blue here, again, increasing amplitude, increasing frequency, until it finally settles down to zero again. And the, the most important feature here is if you take the Hanford observation and put it on top of the Livingston one, you see that the two signals agree with each other. So two instruments, 4,000 kilometers separated from each other, have recorded the same astonishingly minute signal arising from the curvature of space and time. And it's the fact that we are seeing twice the same thing, widely separated, that makes us so confident that this really is a gravitational wave from the depths of the universe and not just a bird flying above or somebody closing the car door 500 miles away. <laughs> to give you some sense of scale, um, black holes, the, black hole, the, the two black holes I'm talking about are about 10 million and 12 million times the mass of the Earth. And size-wise, the, the event horizon, the region of these black holes where you cannot escape into the outside again, is a few hundred kilometers across. The black holes are separated by about 500 kilometers and they are orbiting about each other 10 times per second at a speed about a sixth of the speed of light. Imagine going from uh, Detroit to Ottawa 10 times a second and back. It's, it's truly astonishing. The amount of energy emitted in the gravitational waves by this one collision of the two black holes during the 0.1 seconds where they were most violent was about 50 times as much as the entire rest of the universe combined. So those are truly astonishingly large explosions. Unfortunately, those black holes are in a vacuum environment. There is no gas nearby. So all this energy goes entirely into gravitational waves. And the only way to ever see these particular types of colliding black holes is through the gravitational wave detectors. Now we can do cool things with these types of observation. Of course, discovering gravitational waves is the first thing we were quite proud of, but now the, the more important part is the future to use gravitational waves to explore science and the universe. Louis already alluded to the question, was Einstein right? Are black holes really black holes? Do they really behave as predicted by the uh, theory that Einstein wrote down more than 100 years ago? Well, we have here in gray the measurement of the instruments. And this time in colors, on top of them, I've overlaid the result of the computer calculation I showed you in my first slide, uh, the prediction of Einstein's equations. And as you can see, um, the measurement and the computer calculation of Einstein's equations, they are in nearly perfect agreement. So this particular gravitational wave is perfectly consistent with the prediction of Einstein's equations as are, we don't need any additional physics right now. We don't need to modify Einstein's equations. We can also use, so yet another time, as so many times before, the answer is yes to the question, was Einstein right? We can also use gravitational waves to explore the universe, to learn new things about the universe that weren't known beforehand. In this particular case, the presence of black holes with about 30 and 35 solar masses, merging into a black hole with about 62 solar masses. Uh, we believe this process were to happen, that black holes collide and form bigger ones, but there was no evidence beforehand. Now we have it. And this particular size of black holes, about 30 solar masses, was entirely unknown beforehand. Black holes before were only known as nice puny ones between 5 and 15 solar masses and the very massive ones that Louis mentioned, uh, a million solar masses to a billion solar masses. And by the way, 
um, this is not the only binary black hole collision in the universe. LIGO has detected two more, uh, indicated here as well in this graph. And if you add up the numbers, uh, within the entire universe, there's about a one black hole collision every 15 minutes. So during my talk, quite likely, a gravitational wave from colliding black holes has passed through this room already. Unfortunately, almost certainly, this particular one that happened this today, or this last 15 minutes, was from too far away that the LIGO instruments wouldn't be able to see them because the waves are too weak uh, when they arrive here on Earth. And besides, actually, precisely this week, the LIGO instrument is down anyway. So <laughs> no gravitational waves this week. LIGO is not the only gravitational wave observatory that's, that's in existence. More of them are being commissioned in Europe, in India, and in Japan. And with the bigger set of instruments, we will be seeing more events, and we will learn more information about each event. Most importantly, we will be able to pinpoint much more accurately out of which direction in the sky a certain gravitational wave is coming, so where then we can point uh, normal electromagnetic telescopes and look in the same region in the sky. To close, um, I'd like to show you another movie uh, one of my favorite movies. So this is currently just an image of the Milky Way where I'm highlighting three stars so you can see them in the next slide as well. And now I'm going to place uh, my favorite binary black hole between us, the camera, and the Milky Way in the background. As Luisa has already pointed out, uh, matter, and especially black holes, distort the space around them and distort the direction light is traveling in. So my stars, have suddenly moved to a different place here, uh, further away, and the black holes are sitting here in the middle. If you look carefully, you actually see that there's multiple ways the light can go around the black holes and reach us. So here's a second copy of these three stars, and there's actually a third copy here in the middle. Now let's turn off these, uh, these circles again and actually make the black holes move. And now all this, this lensing of, of light around the black holes becomes time dependent and leads to this really, really beautiful movie uh, which actually is completely correct in, in terms of how colliding black holes would look like if you were sufficiently close to them and if you were to slow down your time by about a factor of 100. And with that, I would like to close and only point out further that LIGO also has a lot of outreach material on their website. So thank you very much. Thank you.